again, our apologies for the unorthodox interruption to the program. We're going to forge ahead. And I believe that Louisa has joined us. I see her there. Uh, we are delighted to welcome Louisa A. E. Gloria. Originally from Baguio City, Louisa A. Gloria is the winner of the 2023 New Immigrant Series Prize for Poetry for Call Bearer. She's the author of Maps for Migrants and Ghosts, co-winner 2019 Crab Orchard Open Poetry Prize, The Buddha Wonders If She Is Having a Midlife Crisis, and 12 other books. Louisa is a Lewis I. Jeff Professor of English and Creative Writing in the MFA program at Old Dominion University. She is a board member of the Muse Writers Center in Norfolk. She was also appointed as the 20th Poet Laureate of the Commonwealth of Virginia, 2020 to 2022. Please join me in welcoming Louisa A. Gloria. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, David, and thank you for all of the participants. Uh, I heard that you were having a few issues, um, and I hope that that wasn't too frustrating for everyone. Can you hear me okay? Is my volume okay? Yes. yes. All right. So I would like to read some poems for you tonight, and I wanted to start with... Uh, a poem from an older collection called Ode to the Heart Smaller Than a Pencil Eraser. And sometimes I like to read this as a kind of invocation, um, as a kind of grounding prayer or poem, maybe. <clears throat> it's called Wanderer. Oh, long awaited, are you nearly here? Is that your shadow I see from the window beginning to cross the field? Everywhere I look, there are emblems from years of laboring, nettles that stung my hands, fronts of palm braided close to patch the holes in the roof. Here are shirts with sleeves of linen to throw on the shapes of the banished as they fly under cover of night, so they too might break free of their long enchantment. Here are grains spilled on muddy ground where they still shine like pearls in moonlight, each one now accounted for. I read tonight that certain moths drink the tears of sleeping birds, turning sorrow into sustenance. Oh, long awaited, I have never left. I am still here. Um, also from the same book, I would like to read uh, this next poem. But before I do so, I just wanted to say that for the last 25 years now, I've been teaching in the English department and MFA creative writing program at Old Dominion University. But I actually began teaching in the Philippines um, this fall, marks my 43rd year as um, an educator. And back then, I never would have imagined a life um, dedicated to writing and teaching poetry, but I am so grateful that my path led me to exactly where I am today. And uh, thinking, some people ask why poetry? or say that they don't really get poetry. But in recent years, especially at the height of the pandemic, I, I'm sure we all felt the same way. Um, we all felt like there's a lot of isolation. We were reaching out, we were looking for ways to create community with others. And I think poetry is the one place I feel answers uh, those kinds of needs like music or other forms of art, it can speak to those places where sometimes we feel we don't even have language for those things yet. And um, that's because poetry delivers or carries or brings us image and thought and emotion all at the same time. Let me read this poem called What You Don't Always See. And there's an epigraph from Hebrews 11, verse one. 
Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I am the sheen of the egg after it drops its sun into the heated pan. I am the cool underlining the day. I am the dry cracked body leaf that falls from the tree under which the sage closed his eyes and made a perfect circle with his finger and thumb and now lies in a frame bought at the temple gift shop. I am the trill of a cricket craning its body towards autumn in the heat. I am the hunger that swerves like a bus on a switchback trail, so the hens and goats being taken to market break out of their makeshift cages, scrambling to safety in the bushes. I am the tremble in the arc of a pendulum weight as it hums from the tension of the silver wire. I am the dream that flickers beneath the eyelids of the child who wakes and names events yet to unfold. I am the filament that lodges in the throat, tasting of salt and bone. And I, I am the clock that stops just short of despair, the zipper's train whistling to the end of the track and back, the shirt that fastens all the way to the top so fingers can loosen the tiny buttons a little or a lot. Yeah. Um, I have to read this short poem, which is a little bit uh, of a different tenor or mood. Um, and I wrote it after learning about some of the strange anatomies in some uh, animals, including the lobster. Yeah. And, you know, in your local supermarket, you'll see some of these um, animals in tanks waiting to be purchased mm -hmm. and eaten. There's a self-portrait as lobster in supermarket aquarium. My arms are bound by thick blue bands of rubber. I want to show the children who come to peer at me through glass how to scissor their enemies, exert with one claw pressure of a hundred pounds per square inch. In a Dutch still life, boiled orange and arranged with shell slashed down the middle beside a toppled goblet, a dish of butter softening in the heat, a tray of nearly moldering lemons. I am meant to be one of many emblems of vanitas. How all things swiftly yield to ruin even before they're buried in the soil, though I and my kind have been known to live up to a hundred years. I am a lesson in deconstructed anatomy, brain in throat, teeth in the abdomen, kidneys in the head, ears in the legs, filaments for taste in the feet. Once I grew to a length of almost five feet, how easy it would have been to be eater rather than the eaten. Uh, I feel a little bad that I can't see everyone in the room, but I'm trusting that everyone is doing okay. Um, it's always nice when people gather in the name of poetry and read to each other. So I'm um, going to read. Uh, okay, I learned that um, there is a new word that has been coined by some scientists uh, to talk about a different kind of nostalgia. And the poem will, I think, make it uh, apparent. But this word is a word that sounds like nostalgia, but isn't. So it is noctalgia. So this poem is about that. Sky grief. Noctalgia is the term scientists have coined to describe the pain we feel and will increasingly feel as it gets more and more impossible to see the night sky. Its vast mysterious stretches pinpricked only by faint galaxy glow and the show of constellations our fathers first taught us to find assembling like a cast of familiar characters against dark velvet curtains. 
Now we shade our eyes from the blare of city lights, the gaudy jewels decorating every monument and tribute to wondrous architectures. Now we seek places where it might still be possible to commune with the dark, open stretch of beach far away from tourist boardwalks, mountain tops where the sky at night still looks like an inverted cup pouring indigo into the throats of valleys. In some cultures, the newly dead are given sky burials. Birds of the air break down the flesh of the body before the bones are ground to dust. In the hill country of my birth, on shelves of limestone, the dead are wrapped in gauze and seated in a row, so in their passage between worlds, they have a view of both earth and sky. Um, Okay, I want to read this poem, which does not appear in any collection yet. I wrote it in May. Uh, some of you know that I keep a daily writing practice, but I wrote it when I learned um, the name of this berry that people sometimes, well, actually more than sometimes, uh, eat and gather from the trees. Maybe you're familiar with it, the service berry. And knowing uh, my love for um, etymology, of course, I went looking for other kinds of stories attached to this fruit. This is Ode to the Service Berry. Late spring bordering on summer, bunnies at twilight come to eat the clover. They have no fear as long as we are behind glass, though the blinds are open. Down the road, people are walking, their dogs and children run ahead in that way that leaves their voices behind. We pluck the darkest red berries from the tree in the schoolyard, Saskatoon, Shadbush, Wild Plum, Shadblow, otherwise known as Service Berry, Harold announcing when Shad swam up coastal rivers in spring, and in an older tongue, blow could mean in a state of blossoming. Also during that time of year when the soil had softened enough after a hard winter, so bodies could be laid on the ground. Traveling preachers held a service under the trees while birds filled themselves with sugar. Um, I want to move into another kind of part of this selection that I've chosen. Um, in the last three or four months, um, well, my mother passed away in late September in the Philippines, and I was not at her side, but I tried to be as present as I could possibly be, despite the distance. And one of these ways was through, you know, writing and thinking and, you know, receiving reports from our caregivers almost every day. They would send little videos from their phones. Um, and it, it's just uh, wonderful that there is some way of keeping in touch uh, despite physical distance. In any case, in the last three or four months, she was mostly hospitalized for various um, ailments, including pneumonia, which combined with her advanced age, led to her death um, on September 21. So I want to read four or five poems that I wrote during this interim. And uh, since they are close to my heart right now, uh, I hope that you will not mind that I read some of them. And they are self-explanatory. So living in the body. The surgeries have gone well, and she is back in the care home. I get pictures the attendants take of her sitting with other residents in the sun. In most of them, she's wearing a pink hat, pink sweater, furry pink slippers. Around her neck, what might look like a pearl necklace, except 
I know it's a rosary of plastic beads. Not long ago, she whispered to my cousin who ceased to her care, I want to live to be a hundred. She is nearly 90. The problem of universals is we're told we cannot partake of both universality and singularity. We can have only knowledge of shadowy particulars, though they are the only reality we know. When I imagine what she might look like at a hundred, bones even more porous than a flute time has played until it's bent, mind starting and stopping like a reel playing scenes of a life, will she have shrunk to a pale abstraction? a Xerox copy of the original she might have been. Despite philosophy, what is eternal is never truly separate from anything we know. In the North, even now, the woods fill with soft, thick drifts of snow. And here in the South, winds strip the leaves off trees, imminence, being where the body resides, they cover the ground until ground is indistinguishable from crepe myrtle and fig leaf, pine straw and oak. The Caregivers. And this one has a, uh, an epigraph, a quote from poet Brian Turner. We are learning how to care for the dead, each in our own way. The caregivers, they are so young, so patient. The three who give eight hours of each day to caring for our mother, our grandmother, because we can't be there ourselves. They take turns dampening her skin, changing her diapers, urging sips of water, and blended serilac and banana, laying a cool cloth on her forehead in answer to the sometimes fevers. This is the stage called the end of life. We read that the body starts to need less and less of what it relied on for decades, flesh trimming away excess until we can almost discern the keel on which the hull was laid the delicate bones of the wrist laddering up to the fingers. In phone videos, she shakes her head or calls the names of her ghosts. Sometimes she has no clue. We say no more to the constant drawing of blood, to the checking of sugars. The body is folding into itself like its own prayer, heedless of time however long the transit. Um, read one more of that maybe, and then read some others that are not directly about my mother's death. But I want to say in the Philippines, um, there's a time difference, right, from here, from where we are. So it's a 12-hour difference. So now it is, what time is it? 6.50 in the evening. It's 6.50 tomorrow there. And when my mother was transitioning uh, and I was getting all these reports, I, I was thinking about her so much and I started writing this poem about death happening in a different time zone. And this is the title of the poem, Death in a Different Time Zone. In Latin, the word equinox means equal night. There are two times each year when day and night are the same length in all parts of the world. On one side, she was dying. On the other, she was already dead. Her breaths having slowed until they could not miss the mirror anymore. The three women who cared for her until the end folded the sheets and prepared her body for its last ceremony of fire, for sifting into an urn bearing her name. On this side of the world, on that first day of her actual crossing, alarms sounded on all our phones as we sat in offices and classrooms. They signaled potential coastal flooding in the next 36 hours, 
from a tropical storm bearing down on the eastern seaboard. But what do you call the room in the sky where the sun's circuit and the celestial equator intersect? The earth turns and light can't bend. It's dark in that half of the earth not facing the sun. Could you just keep traveling west so tomorrow never catches up? Yesterday, she was only dying or she had only just died. Today, she is dead. We mourn only what we can name. Once I was told it is bad luck to name your child after a person that has died. For many years, it paralyzed me to think I might have doomed you thus to a life of tribulation, second or fifth in the line of matriarchs, junior or third in male succession, until I realized whatever name we are given, the naming itself is what confers the condition of grievability. Out of the shapeless dark, someone gives you this name you will answer to all your life, a claiming but one that comes with all that it entails. You can't lose what you haven't brought close to your breast. You can't mourn what you haven't named enough to lose. Um, okay, this is called Becoming Subatomic. When flying, it's possible to carry the cremated remains of a loved one in a TSA-approved urn that can be x-rayed. Usually, it can't be checked in with the rest of your luggage. Some companies advertise that you can send them minuscule amounts of the cremains, which they'll turn into cloudy lockets, tinted like amethyst and polished like pearl. You can simply put them into a pouch with the rest of your jewelry, more precious now than any resin or silver statement necklace. Why not just keep snippets of hair like the Victorians did, my husband asks, to the end, wary of rules, penalties, the red tape of forms. Consider a record company which will press for a fee your ashes into a vinyl album. Moving over those places in the groove, sometimes the needle will jump and make static crackling sounds. Your voice from the beyond, or simply the sound of matter, your own, poured into a sheet of PVC, which could take a thousand years, maybe more, to decompose. I think I'll just read uh, this one is new. It will be um, published along with the other poems in Call Bearer, which is coming out from Black Lawrence Press in sometime in the summer of 2024. It's called What We Want. My friend who's recently become a parent is venting again about the ways working moms are so unnoticed and uncompensated, if at all. Her LinkedIn profile has description like results-oriented and self-starter, public policy analyst, program director. She owns and can actually pull off wearing a fancy gold-collared jumpsuit she leads a nonprofit organization and hops on planes to attend conferences out of state. But I know too well that kind of physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion, though we might have gentle, supportive partners and a freezer drawer packed with microwavable meatballs or emergency dumplings. After I delivered my last child, such an easy sounding word like something one does, with takeout pizza and wings plus extra fries. Groggy and sleep deprived, I went back to work after only 10 days, 
since I had no maternity leave benefits, lecturing on critical analysis and woman warrior before a room full of mostly bored students, I'd feel my milk and gorged breasts leak underneath my blazer and flush from embarrassment, but mostly from the fear I'd be reduced to just a body that did whatever things a body did before pushing another body into the world. I do, but also don't want to tell my friend that it all gets easier somewhere down the line. Untruth that rolls off each page of books with titles like On Becoming a Woman and The Housewife's Guide to Becoming Wealthy, slip covers depicting impeccable houses and the women with impossibly narrow postpartum waists who live there. But I do want to say that has not and never has been a country of easy, whichever way we look at it. There are parts of me that want to answer an ad for caretaker of a remote island between the west coast of Scotland and the Isle of Skye, and parts that want to stay writing in a coffee shop until the baristas kick me out. Parts of me will sob, wring their hands, and want to die, but not do it after all, though life as we know is so hard and people so heartless. But tomorrow, there's a farmer's market where one can get the crunchiest peas and fresh strawberries. I want to make something good from that and just watch the people I love eat it. The way my mother would stand at the kitchen door watching me clean my plate after school, eyes puffy after a good cry of her own. And for my last poem, I'd like to read also from the coming forthcoming call bearer, a poem called Phenomenology of Return. Don't we all wish to return, to discover how infinity reaches across the world in a shimmer of overlapping circles unfazed by obstacle? It simply goes around each tree in the wood spreads a filmy veil over every house, falling down shed, office building, and church. The sign above the 24-hour drugstore and pool hall, the alley where stray cats congregate, giving rise to rumors about the most delicious steamed meat buns in the noodle shop next door. In the story about a fish that grants a boon, the fisherman's wife knows sweetest meanings are always closest to the bone. She tells him to go back and ask a deeper question, which sadly he interprets as merely a demand for more. Here she is, setting out to do the hard work herself then, peeling back the body's outer cover, waterproofing the heart, re-rigging the wings. So much ceremony in order to arrive at the spot where the water gushes without measure, gives before one even thinks to ask. Thank you so much for listening. Louisa, I hope you could hear the applause from the room, although you cannot see us. We thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, personally, I wish to express my condolences on the loss of your mother, and I'm sure the others in the room share that sentiment. Uh, and we are particularly grateful for your willingness to share your vulnerability and the, the passions of your heart with us. It's been an honor to have you this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we flipped our agenda uh, to make uh, use of the time. So everyone who uh, had signed up to read has, has read at least once. Uh, Dr. David Sam didn't get to, to finish his plan. Steve? 
We have some online people who didn't get a chance. Uh, and thank you. We have some online people. Um, did any of the online people uh, plan to read a poem? I didn't see any names in the chat, but I don't have a, a tablet to monitor. Madeline? Madeline, did you have anything? Yes, I'll be glad to share. I was typing. <laughs> oh, you were typing. I, I can't see what you're typing. So <laughs> That's all right. welcome, we would welcome your poem if this is a good time. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> you want me to turn the video on? That would be lovely. Okay. <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay, we can see you now. Thank you. Okay. Um, I had the opportunity to attend Kathleen Decker's workshop um, that led to the book Blended Voices. And I thought I would share one of my poems that um, came from that workshop and that will be in the book Blended Voices. The purpose, um, she gave us four poets and we were to choose one line from each of the poets poem and then work it into our own poem. And I chose Edgar Allan Poe's Sonnet to Science, Kareen Wood's Smoke, Anne Bethel Spencer Requiem, and Ruby Altizer Roberts' Cocoon. And the name of my poem is Gray-Haired Woman. Oh, grandmother dear, you sit before me in your faded chair as if waiting. Perhaps you are. I choose to remember time before your worn down body left me with only memories. The ghosts of former times weigh upon my mind and heart. I smell your perfectly fried chicken. I taste your lemon pie. Can you understand? You who prayest thou thus upon the poet's heart that I need more than these memories. Remember all those days when we snapped green beans and shucked sweet corn? These August nights we sat by your workbench where I learned to make a quilt. Oh, that quilt, I have it still with fine stitches where you applicate my mother's life from scraps of blankets used and long forgotten. I know the time will come when your gray threaded hair lies upon the satin pillow of your last bed. I must face reality. The grave restores what finds it best and prove the darker firmament of grief, but grief shall not control my number days, for you have left your magic and your strength to nurture in my heart. Thank you, Madeline. That was lovely. What a tribute. Joy or Kathy Haley, did either of you wish to read? No, thank you. No, thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sam, would you like to share a few more of your pieces? Uh, yeah. yeah, you barely got a chance. We had one and a half phones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe a sermon. Um, maybe it's appropriate that that happened in a poetry reading in a time when people are so threatened by words and books that they want to ban them, that they want to burn them. Um, it's a small violence that was done. But in a time of violence, when people, some people have such a burning need to be by negating your being, 
maybe it was appropriate that that happened, that um, we be reminded of, of the violence going on in the world, um, whether it's a little violence, a medium-sized violence, or a big violence in, in uh, Israel and Gaza Strip or in Maine or wherever. I um, was bullied when I was seven. And one of the nice things about becoming a leader is that I could deal more effectively with bullies. Um, but a bully has that terrible need to say I am by somehow saying you're not. And um, so maybe there's a poem in all that. I don't know. But um, to start off on that maybe darker theme um, and then go back to some things that maybe are lighter or share, shed more light. Uh, my collection Stone Bird imagined a, an exile from Syri the Syrian civil war who comes to the United States leaves everything behind and finds that there's no home here either. Um, based in part on my readings of the experiences of people who did escape the conflict there or others in the Arab diaspora, uh, also based a little bit on my grandfather who came from Syria along with my grandmother over 100 years ago. Uh, he was a Christian Arab, and he was told that the streets were paved with gold. And maybe I'll read a poem about him from another collection, Dark Fathers. Uh, but this, this character, um, the poems are written either in his voice or in the third person. Um, and this poem, I think, talks about something that is going on now and has been going on for millennia in the Middle East. Blood cries the earth. Hard wind whinnies a sirocco in ghosts of dark prayer and tombs are shattered from the cold myths ride wraiths of pallid fathers on the bones of their steeds, man and beast alike breathing deceits of frost into the coming night. The fathers shriek arcs of falling detonation as death falls across the desert, and the sky empties itself in falling shards of ice. All murdered, all and pass this destiny of blood to you who face each other near black tides of desperate sea. With a word, you shout your frozen history, drawn and aimed by centuries, burning their desolation across a sear land. You raise your misunderstanding in your hands and speak weapons that you somehow pray can sink. So the story of the exile, um, the lonely man who um, speaks a little English and doesn't really fit in. And the image of the stone bird is from his garden where there is a stone statue. And um, I'll read a couple more poems from this collection that conclude the book. This one in his voice, past all aging. I stand between the wind and emptiness under the voiceless sky beside the sea guttural in its long crash of dark waters. I am older now than I had ever thought to be, and hunger 
no longer dances at my dinner table as I fast alone. Here I am as abandoned as a deserted ruin, partly subsumed in the wind's constant sculpting of dunes. I could buy dreams from any promise at the raucous market of false prophets, but I turn my face away. Let me sit, break bread, and scatter it to a gratitude of pigeons and sparrows who call it blessing. For I am the beggar, and these feathered hopes are generous in their eating what I give before their gracious flight. The end of the book, he disappears from the book, may have gone back to what was his home. We don't really know. The final ambiguity of exile. He was never gone enough. He was never here. He may be on the ocean or in the sand or above both in the air. All he loved, he wedded to others, and all he warred, he widowed. He made himself a spring wind to blow with dry rain across what once was fertile. He made himself the crescent of moon that rhymed the morning before the third rising of the sun. What he had been, he cannot be. What he has become lies abandoned with his garden, glistening with the last evening's frost. The stone bird reaches with frozen wings in feathers of a riddle. So I, I talked about my, my grandfather and the book, Dark Fathers, uh, is about my father and my relationship with him and his father and his relationship with my father. And I never had a relationship with my grandfather. He passed before I was born. Um, so lineage. A shadow of howls wakes the cry of the dark grandfather, coal black for eyes and lupine hunger. Your dreams were the images in a stream fragmenting moonlight with brittle waves. I flow from you, grandfather, in a haze of cigarette smoke and the incantations of wine spilled into a drunken snowbank. You damned the good Samaritans who brought you home to my grandmother and my father and were damned in return. I hear you cry the night in the empty space where God once stood full of mere prayers. What did you have left to sell from your peddler's cart when the earth spoke its soil welcome? Um, most of the poem is about my relationship with my father, uh, mothers and fathers, uh, mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, often complicated, contradictory, complex, difficult, um, interesting relationships. Um, I had a great relationship with my father until I started looking like a small man and things started getting difficult. Um, this poem was written at a time when we were close to estranged. Hungry inside. Hungry inside, my father eats his way out of my flesh. When he is free of me, all that is left of him within is a rough brown scab 
like a surgeon's wound along the left of my abdomen. Hungry outside, my father tries to cut back in. He cannot. Beneath the scab, the scars pale, lifeless but firm and tough. It lets nothing back within. His hunger unable to do more than scratch at my flesh. I love him as I love each wound. They are so hungry to be still inside me. But I remove him from my flesh and I remove the scab, stand back, admire the whitened scar, paled, nerveless, hardened. Sometimes there is a little blood. We both live long enough, luckily, blessedly, to grow up, to forgive ourselves for being who we were, mere human men, and forgive each other for not being who we wanted each other to be, um, despite not taking care of himself, he managed to make it to 78 after heart attacks. Um, this is uh, getting near the end of his life. First and last. First, there is just darkness, a long pause as the heart dies. See, he breathes but with difficulty. I remember the time he kicked my dog from the newly painted porch. I thought he was a son of a bitch. Then years later, he gently cradled the same dog in his arms as the vet injected it with death. I found out just today the dog had brain cancer. For 27 years, he's kept that knowledge from me. But he can't keep death's knowledge from himself. Beneath each faltering, the half-dead heart still pumps, wondering if that last thud in him is the last thud he will feel, the last just before the darkness, and when the machines fail and new therapies don't work, the operations cannot open heart's blood. In the end, there is just darkness. I can see it in the furrows plowed into his forehead. My father is afraid now. I would cradle him in my arms if it would make the knowledge go away. Uh, we're near Halloween. So I thought I'd read a Halloween poem that's also about my dad. Harrowing Hallows Evening. I am sorry, but I cannot believe you in your total absence from everywhere, except in resurrections of dreams. I am sorry that I witnessed your body gaping mouth from loosing soul to its escape wherever it goes now. I am sorry that I touched a cold shell that was not you, although you had once been so cold and rigid in your living. You were not so when you fell back into your death chair while playing with the children in your store. I'm sorry. I am sorry it has been seven years that I have hoped to reawaken you to your deep voice and lighter smiles. Today, Halloween, your favorite of holidays, I look into the masks of every ringer of our door and hope to see your black eyes filled with sparks of laughter, pretending that you do not 
now where death is your ever costume. I am sorry that as I go to sleep, I still am trying to let you go so you can lay the path I have to follow in my own way. If you can, make the way clear as once you did, holding my hand along dark streets, showing me the tricks of shadows on older All Saints' Eves when spirits rose and memories were made. I am sorry that I still jump at such old ghosts. And looking back on the memories when I was very young, navigation by dream. His large hand encompassed my small, his hand hard, mine soft as youth. We walked a dream, a forested ridge, watched by a fragile yearling contained by mist. He gathered wild onion and wild carrot for stew. He browned the beef in a bubbling of butter, then cooked in a blackened pot. I stirred with expectation. We sat above the covered bridge above the muddy river and ate from flat aluminum plates with stainless steel spoons. He pointed to the Milky Way and the bear and Polaris and said this was the guiding light he hadn't found in church, the way he navigated, the way his father had not found. He never showed me the photo of his dark father dead before my birth. Instead, he held my hand as we stumbled down the slag heap that smoked beside the river that smolders still in dream. And I wonder if I could maybe try reading Red Clay Sunrise again. I, th I think that's where, um, the, I, I won't call him a gentleman, invaded. This Yankee come here, Virginian by opportunity and choice, met the mountain singers and the city music makers, heard the unvoiced despair of poor hope in Richmond streets and in shacks along hillside hollers, saw the new ships building in harbors where old ships once brought crazy, hoping, hungry pioneers up the James River towards Jefferson's westward vision, declaration of rising sunsets, carried by patriots who cleared land and native peoples, fought their own chains while forging black hands to harsh fields, met the descendants of history and the new wayfarers of Reston and Richmond, building the business from nothing and hard ideas, remet the American birthplace of Virginian legacies and sorrows and found this place, red soil, and lost tobacco, still ready for the passion of plows, new order in a new land where many hands can still make good work with our one common wheel. And what do you, maybe one or two more? One more? This might be a quieter one to end on. Prayer. The holiness came to me in a brown feathered surprise. A Carolina wren clutching itself to the window screen and singing one foot from my unclenched face. Then it flew to the lilac, shaking its purple fragrance free filled with such scent and sound, 
I unchoked my faith in words held together by fragile music. And my lips formed themselves in the shape of a bird as the silence escaped as psalm. Thank you all for your patience. Thank you, David. That was spectacular. I would like to echo Dr. Sam's thought about going forth with a little peace, despite some rough sailing we had this evening. I'll read a poem that I wrote entitled Songs of the Southern Rim with a note about the Grand Canyon. How many of you have been there? Anybody? Yes. It's a magical place. And during daylight hours, the differences in temperature generate air currents within the Grand Canyon. And local lore holds that at nightfall, when warm air rises and cooler air sinks, for the final time, the canyon breathes its last breath of the day. And this is Songs of the Southern Rim. Quiet calls from the corners of these walls as a frosted sun descends and lends flame to painted halls. Raven wings whisper when the canyon sings lullabies of lavender on her harp of pinion strings, grace note soars, condors row on silent oars, fairy cargo of my dreams over streams to heaven's shores as dusk falls. One last breath, the warm wind stalls just before the daylight dies. Red rock sighs and quiet calls. Thank you so much for being here this evening. And as you go out, the, the quiet, I hope that you will treasure some of the poems that you heard tonight. Thank you again for being with us.